Okay, so thanks for coming again. And of course, this is a joke. Uh, we all know how things went uh, with C11. So my name is Sławomir Zborowski. I am a software engineer at Nokia, and I'm going to give a talk about C17, which is going to be similar game changer as C11 once was. Okay, before I get to the topic, let me introduce myself to you by answering a simple question. What actually led me to a C++? So, how many of you started programming or hacking computers, computers while being a teenager? Please raise your hands. Okay, I see most of you. And I belong to the same group of people. So, the other day when I was 12, we had this Commodore 64 computer in home, and I was interested uh, in playing some games on it. But in order to play some game, I needed to learn the programming language. So, because the interface was not very friendly. How many of you remember this screen? Great. I didn't expect this high amount. Okay, so it's good from, I can, when currently we, we have these graphical interfaces and we, when we have this many, we can choose some option, but we don't actually know what's underneath. And with command line, you actually need to go to the terminal and uh, open a manual, and then you can see the full power. That's why I think it's very good to start with command line. Okay, and then my parents decided to buy me an x86 machine, and uh, so I was particularly interested in how internet pages are working, so I discovered this HTML technology, and it led me to a CSS and eventually JavaScript with which is in contrast to HTML and CSS, a programming language. And from the JavaScript, it was relatively easy to jump to the server-side scripting. And I was thinking, okay, if I know JavaScript, then the backend programming should be almost the same thing. Well, I was wrong, completely wrong, because front-end programming is easy if you compare it to backend programming. Okay. And Maybe some of you know that uh, PHP is told to be a combination of C, Java, and traditional Chinese. That's why I switched to C and then uh, to C++. I also stopped using PHP in favor of Python, but the C++ became my language of choice. And I'm currently, uh, it's taking me several years to master this language. And then when I see a book like this, teach yourself C++ in 21 one days, then I'm, I think, what, what the hell? And why they always put this 21? Maybe because 42 divided by 2 is 21. Maybe, maybe that's the answer. I don't know. But then I saw this one. Teach yourself C++ in 24 hours. So this is completely weird, weird thing, and it's not the final one. The last, the last book that you can actually find in a bookstore or Amazon was this, teach yourself C++ in <laughs> 10 minutes. Okay, I don't know how about you, but I, it made me feel a bit sad because I'm wasting a lot of years to master this language and I can find such a books, so that's just crazy. And the other thing that made me sad was more and more people were saying that C++ is going to die. It's a dying language. So I decided to dig into this topic and discover whether this, it is true, because a lot of haters say so. And after my research, I discovered that after revolutionary changes in C++11 and some minor improvements in C++14, we are heading towards C++17, which is going to introduce groundbreaking changes in C++ ecosystem. And regarding those haters, well, haters gonna hate, potatoes gonna potate. So let's ignore this topic. Okay, so now let's get to the topic. So the plan is to show you some selection of the things that are going to be included in C17. And of course, this is not all of the things. And I decided to split this presentation into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about changes that will be included in the core language. And in the second part, I'm going to cover all of the changes that will become the part of library part of the language. Okay, and a structure for all of those points will be similar. I will start with uh, explaining what is the problem and then 
I will give you some view how things will look like in C17. Okay, so let's get started with modules. So in C++, we don't really have modules at all, right? So the question is from where we have this preprocessor and this inclusion model, do you know? From C, exactly. And since C was developed almost 40 years ago, so we have something that we are still using. It has uh, almost 40 years. And so the question is, if we still use it and we don't change it, then it has to offer a lot and it has to be a very good tool. Well, it's not the case, unfortunately. So consider this simple example. We have this full function which, in essence, will do some calculation and will use this sine function. And since sine function is not built in into C++, then we need to include it from C math header. So in this listing, we are like, this C++, would you pass me the salt? And the C++ is like, here you are. <laughs> Here's your salt. So the problem is, the first problem is that we either got all or nothing. And if we look at it from the library writer perspective, then this guy cannot control what is being exported. So that's another bad thing about includes. And the community developed some solutions to this, like the detail namespace. However, let's be honest, it's only a workaround and not a solution. Okay, if you go further, we can see a lot of more problems, like how many of you work with legacy code? Okay, I see most of you. And if you work with legacy code, there is a possibility that the, this code will be uh, written in C. And for some reason, the guys that were writing this code in C, they loved macros. So at some point, you will need Maybe, as in this example, we are including some platform services. At some point, you will need to put some define to be sure that the right thing will be included into your project. Okay, and the last thing that I like to cover, because there are a lot of problems with, uh, with our current solution, but I'm not going to talk for a whole presentation about it. Consider we have some header which exports something, it doesn't matter, and we have a lot of source files, let's say 100. And those source files will include this header and do some stuff. It doesn't matter, again. So now the question is, what will compiler do with this? Will it open this header file only once and then process it and use in all of those places? Well, let's see. Let's use some command line foo. Here, I'm using G++ against all of the files that I have in the directory. And then I wrap it using S trace tool. I hope you know this tool. It will report all of the syscalls that was made by G++. But I'm only interested in open events. And I also filter this by a name of a file. And the results are apparently the compiler will open this file and process it over and over. Over and over. And in case of G++, it's even worse. Because each time it will try to open this header, it will try to open the precompiled version as well. So if we have 100 includes, then we will have 200 system calls. And that's not very good, as, as you can imagine. So the, the last problem that I'm covering right now is that this inclusion model doesn't scale. If you think of a project that has 1 million lines of code, and it takes 3 seconds for some file to compile, it's normal with Boost Spirit or other library. It seems innocent, right? However, if we are using this file in 50 other source files, then we'll wait two and a half minutes just it to compile. So it's a waste of time and it should be improved. Okay, and now the modules are the thing uh, developed by the guys from Microsoft that are going to change this. And because the picture is worth more than 1,000 of words, let me show you an example how they will look. So the very first uh, difference is at the top. Instead of include that we are used to, we have this import keyword. And after import keyword, we are explicitly stating what we are going to import to our project. And if we wanted to be more picky, we could write like import cmav.sign and we would have only the sign function imported. 
That's a very big feature of the modules. Okay, so it's just that simple. Uh, you know all languages like Python or Java. Okay, so the syntax is the same, so it's, it should be intuitive. So while we know how to import things, like here we are importing std vector and std string, then the, question, the next question is how do we actually export things? So in order to export something, we need to tell the compiler in which module we are, and we use the module keyword here to inform the compiler about the name of our module. We use some name, like foo, and then we can export things. And to export things, we use, surprise, surprise, export keyword. And we can use this keyword against single de declaration, or we can use this keyword against a block. And maybe you notice that in this example, I combined export with a namespace. Why? Well, the answer is that in C++, we already have eight scoping, scoping abstractions. So the decision was made that introducing a new scoping abstraction will not make things easier. That's why we need to combine those. And inside of this block, we are exporting what we want. And the other funny thing is that, you know, in our projects, we al always have this one guy that will say that macros are good and will try to destroy the whole concept. So it will not work because the guys from modules, they predicted it and uh, it said that uh, all of the preprocessor directives will have no effect inside of this block. And it is very good because it is the first sign that preprocessor is going to go away. Okay, and using the modules, our, uh, our custom module that we exported is just as simple. Again, we use this import keyword and we, we provide the name of our module. Okay, and since that point, uh, we will be able to use all of the functions that were exported. And one more remark, uh, since that point, uh, it means that everything below will be exported from under this name. So it means that we can have multiple modules exported from the same file. It can be useful when we generate a code from some other source. Okay, so that would be for modules. Now let's switch to other exciting feature that is going to be included in C++. Resumable functions, also known as uh, coroutines. Okay, so again, let's start with some example. If we write synchronous code uh, as servers, then eventually everything will boil down to this. There will be some while loop, and the first thing we will do is get some requests from a client, then we will handle, uh, find a handler to handle this, and the last step will be to put this request to the sender and get the results. Okay, so now let's assume that our handlers are doing more or less the same thing. So they will get some data from database, then they will print something, and at the end they will send some notifications over a network to, let's say, some other nodes in the system. So now the question is, is its solution actually good? Well, as in other questions in computer science, the proper answer is it depends. Because if you consider such an example where we have this, our application, and some client makes a request, then our application will need to process this request, and while processing, the, our CPU will be busy. That's kind of obvious. So now what happens if our application is processing the request, but in the meantime, some other clients will make their own request? What will happen? Well, the request cannot be handled, so here's the place where operating system kicks in with all of the buffers and all of the stuff we have in operating system like Linux and so on. So the requests will not be handled immediately. They will be stored and handled afterwards. So, as you can see, it's problematic because the clients will need to wait more and in case we run out of these buffers, then we'll drop the request and this is definitely not what we want. So, the first thing that comes to mind is multi-threading. Because why not? So, consider we now have this application with four cores and some load balancer and now four clients are making the request 
so we will be able to handle them simultaneously. However, if two other clients will make the request as well, then we will have the same problem. So the problem still exists, but we just move it uh, by two meters, let's say. So we can use some other techniques like thread pools, uh, but then we need to decide how many workers, or maybe this is dynamic. Uh, we would like to avoid context switches because it is expensive, and also uh, each thread consumes, at least on standard line of distribution, about eight megabytes of RAM. So maybe it doesn't hurt on machine with eight gigabytes, but on a mobile device it can be meaningful. So it seems that we are addressing the problem from the wrong way. So what is the right way? What is the actual problem? Well, the problem is, is that we, our code is actually synchronous. What does it mean? It means that if we want something from a database, it will eventually be a system call. And the system call will block our process, so we'll need to wait for results. And the same happens for this and this. So this can even take like three seconds, and our CPU will just wait for the results. So that's clearly not what we want. How do we address this? Well, we write asynchronous code. So we need to rewrite everything and make it asynchronous. And the coroutines is a tool that provides us a way to write this asynchronous code, but it will still look like it was synchronous. So it will not become a spaghetti, as it happens with normal uh, asynchronous code. You have those callbacks and the programs are hard to reason about and so on. OK, so how do they look? Well, the most important thing here is this await. This is some implementation, contrived implementation, how this handle could look like. So this await keyword is an operator that will accept our call. And right after making this call, it will suspend our function. And after it suspends us, then the CPU is able to uh, handle some other client or do some other task, which is good. And in the meantime, the database will execute uh, its own task. And when the results are ready, then the event loop that is involved here will resume our function in the next sequence point. So we will have our results. But in the meantime, the CPU was able to actually uh, compute some other thing. And the cool thing about this await operator is that you can actually use it also with for loops. So if you have something like this, uh, a cursor fetch all, and calling begin will yield a syscall, then you can just uh, append this await operator in front of the for, and it will happen automatically. It will do the magic, which is also a very good feature uh, of coroutines. OK, and other stuff that uh, is here in the listing is basically the same. So I'm not going to dive in into. And the other thing, which is not covered in my slides, is the Yelp keyword that will be also introduced. Do you know the Yelp keyword from other languages? It is commonly used to implement generators, but I had to decide whether to show this or this. OK, so if we use, start using coroutines, then, uh, sorry, then our application will actually be able to, to scale to the limit of our hardware. So we will be able to uh, handle more and more clients because this event loop will be continuously suspend and resume the functions that, should, that are needed to, to keep you working. OK, so that would be for, for the resumable functions. Now let's uh, move on with concepts. How many of you know about concepts? I expect whole audience should raise hands because the work started in 2005, so it's already 10, uh, 10 years. So let's stop for a while and ask ourselves a question. Why do we need those concepts and what for they are? So if we write some library, then we want it to be generic so it will work with all of the types. And we don't want duplication of the code, so we start using templates from C++. And it usually starts this way, template type name T, and then we pass this library to the user, and the user is, uh, man, 
how should I use it, what kind of types I can use with this function, and so on. So if the name of the function is not very clear, then the user will have troubles actually seeing what can be done with this function. And from the library writer perspective, it's also not very good that we have only this type name and t. Why? Well, he has no control what is being passed in, and he definitely doesn't want the function to misbehave. So we need to somehow mitigate those problems, and how this usually ends. Just like this. And I'm not, don't panic, I'm not going to describe what's happening here. I just wanted to make my point that the, uh, neither the library writer nor the user is happy about the situation because it's hard to decipher what's happening and it's hard to decide, okay, can I put this type to this function? And maybe the, uh, the user will play IT Russian roulette and will pass some type and then he will get some thing that looks like a broken XML file and that's also not very friendly from the compiler. So the concepts are the thing that are going to change this. They are awaited for a long time, but they were accepted, outvoted, so they will definitely be part of C++17. And you can think of them as a type system for a type system, but, but don't be afraid, it's not that complicated. And once you start using them, then it becomes very intuitive. And it is all about enforcing an interface for some type that is known at compile time, and readable error messages. Okay, so again, let's have an example. And uh, in the proposal, uh, there are a lot of examples, but I'm not going to show them all. So I selected the simplest one, and let's have a look. So if you want some type to actually fulfill some interface, then we need to define this concept. And it is all about putting this keyword concept uh, the value will be boolean, whether some type is good with concept or not. And then the crucial part is that we should give some meaningful name, like has operator add, because it's clear. Now the user that will use our template will not need to dive in into code to see what, what should be passed to the function. And then we have this requires function, which is template, and we can pass everything here. And the trick is that in body, we can write everything, and if the body will compile, then the value of this concept will become true. And if we will not compile, then the value will be false. So it means for all of the types, t, which implements operator plus, this should compile, and the else some type, it doesn't matter. So the concept will be satisfied. For all of the other types that does not provide this operator, it will become false. And then in the function, we provide uh, this has operator add instead of type name. So has operator add is definitely better than, than type name t. Okay, so as you can see, it, uh, it's a win-win situation because both user and the library writer are happy. So that's a good thing. Okay, so that would be all for core changes that are going to change C++. Now let's move on to libraries that are going to appear in C++17. Before I start with ranges, let me actually make a, some comparison between C++ and the rest of the languages when it comes to libraries. So if we have some other popular language like Python or Java, then the library looks like Swiss Army Knife. You know, we can do a lot of things with it. Uh, everything is on, on the board already. That's cool, right? You can even run HTTP server in a Python with one line. When it comes to C++, things are quite not very good, I could say. It's more, it's more like French army knife. So you, can, you have some vector, you have some other thing, but not, not very much to work with. Okay, so let's, this situation is going to change with C17 as well. So let's start with ranges. And now I like you to spot an error on this slide. Okay, so it was 10 seconds. 
and okay, a couple of seconds to, to actually find this bug. And the bug is that we are providing two different uh, iterators from two different uh, containers to single STL function find if. So the first one, the, the begin comes from HSPDSCH and the second comes from, from HSDPCCH. So what will happen? Well, a spectacular failure during the runtime. And those names are not random. Actually, they are the name of the channels in WCDMA technology, so you can encounter such a name in, in a production code. And I even used uh, Python dflip sequence matcher to see how similar those words are from the machine perspective, and it is more than 70%. So if we have 70% here, then a human can make this mistake even by wrong suggestion provided by ID. So what can we say about iterators? We can say that they are good when it comes to point to one position in a container, but when it comes to pointing to a wrench, then they are poor. Why? Well, they are inconvenient, they are verbose, you need to type much, and of course, as you saw, we can introduce some bugs. And also th what's important is that we'd like to have some abstraction for a wrench, but we don't have, and uh, that would be nice. So th this is for what we have the strangers by Eric Nibler. And basically it boils down to something like this. We have this vector V and we want to use some algorithm. Then we simply pass this V to the sort function, which comes from the ranges namespace. And it will convert it to a range type and then do the thing automatically. But the ranges are not only about this. Consider this example. You have an input, which is a vector of uh, numbers, and you would like to remove all of the odd numbers and then convert this whole thing to a vector of a strings. How do you do this in traditional way? Well, let's pick up the naive version. So you have this for loop uh, for removing the elements. Then you have another for loop to actually transform numbers to strings. And then you have a bunch of temporary values. OK, if you are more clever, then you'll use STL. So you will have uh, remove if, then you need to combine it with erase on the container. And then you will have uh, transform. But still, you will have those <coughs> variables that are needed. With ranges, you can do this like this. It's much simpler. Consider we have this uh, vector. And then we are using algorithms from the special view namespace. And all of the algorithms in the view namespace, they are actually objects that provide the pipe operator. And we can use our V vector with this pipe operator from this algorithm, uh, which is remove if. And then we provide some lambda. And this lambda will actually uh, remove all the elements from the container, actually from the wrench. And then we uh, use this operator again. And we transform all of the integers to a string by using uh, std to string, which was introduced in C11. And then we have wrench, which will look like this. So this is what we wanted, and in more elegant way. OK. And the cool thing is that all of the uh, SCL algorithms are already there in the ranges. And if we want to mutate, actually, this vector in place, then we need to change this view to action namespace, and it should work the same way. However, performance should be more or less the same, but on my machine, it turned out that there are some gotchas, and I need to actually check what's going on. But don't worry, because theoretically, it should be more or less the same. Right? It's only a range. OK, so next, next, let's move to file system. And this will be a short one. So a lot of applications currently are using file systems, right? So C++, in C++, we can operate with files. Uh, but we can't create directory in a standard way. That's why they are going to translate the boost file system version 3 to a C++. So we will be able to actually do more stuff with file systems. 
And we all know directories and so on, so I'm not going to describe what's going to be the part of this library. So it's nothing astonishing. However, don't, don't forget that we are still in a C++. So what can happen? We can have a situation when we are running on some embedded device and there is no file system at all. So we need to think when we do programs, right? Okay, so the next big library that's going to be included in C17 is a network. How networking looks like in C++ currently? Well, we need to choose some networking library. And if we make a wrong decision, then after, let's say, two years, we will have a problem because let's assume it was not portable and we will need to rewrite some portion of the code, which is not good. And the other can have some bugs and so on. And I see that a lot of C++ application, applications are already using networking in some way. So, and we, we have this Internet of Things coming. So majority of applications will have to do something with networking. That's the reason I think we need networking in C++, the standard way to, to cope with network. And this will also happen as the uh, library from the booth will be transplanted to, to C++ as well, the asynchronous input and output. And let's have a look how it will all look in C++ 17. So when it comes to synchronous uh, execution, then we can use uh, streams that are similar to <coughs> IO streams and see how simple it is. We create the stream, we connect it to some example.com and we provide a protocol here. And afterwards, we use this as ordinary stream, so we put some uh, HTTP request. And also handling responses is very simple. But this is for synchronous code, so basically for small tools that we develop. However, in production code, we can't really do this because it will block whole uh, CPU. So we need to write asynchronous code. And don't panic, I'm not going to describe it right now. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, spaghetti code. We have a lot of core bugs, and it's actually hard to reason about this program. So that's why I'm not go uh, going to go into details and quirks about it. But the good thing is that we can combine, actually, the features that are going to come with C++. So if you combine, coroutines with network, then this code can look good again. So we will use this await operator against reading and sending. And as you can see, this code is simpler when you look at it. OK, great. OK, so now let's move on to parallel. Uh, so if we have to implement some application that is CPU intensive, then what do we do? How do we design this system? Well, we try to parallelize everything that is possible to utilize all of the resources the machine is providing. So now the question is, because in our algorithms we are using STL, so how about STL? Let's consider a simple example with STD Accumulate. So with STD Accumulate, uh, you provide this begin, and then you provide this end, and you start with zero. And this will execute only on one thread. So it will get all of the input. It will put this input to one thread, and then it will give answer at some point. But in the meantime, all of the other threads, they will be not busy, or they will be maybe doing something which is not relevant to the task. What we, need, what we need here is some other kind of execution. We would like this accumulate to actually get all of the data and spread this data to multiple threads. And if on our CPU we have extensions, like SIMD extensions, and the processor can vectorize things, then we would like this accumulate function to actually detect this and to use all of the extensions that are possible at the moment. OK, so this is what actually we'd like to have with STL. 
This isn't the case right now. However, the parallel STL is coming. And it will be a standard implementation for uh, all of the algorithms from STL, but for parallel execution. So we currently we can you know split this whole input range into parts and then run this accumulate separately. But perhaps it's possibility that we will introduce some bugs, and the standard implementation is uh, always better one. And it will provide three execution policies. The first one is uh, SIG, which is the traditional way we are using right now. The second is parallel, which means that the algorithm will use multiple threads um, to do the thing. And the, sec uh, the last one is parallelized with vectorization. So it means it will take uh, the input and it will spread it over some threads. And at the end, it will actually also use the vectorization and other stuff that can be used in the processor. OK, and all of the algorithms that are going to be included here. So that's like a very good thing. And the policy can actually be set in runtime. That's another feature. And let's see an example. How does it look? So at the very top, we are using a CD parallel function, so we don't have any clashes. And then uh, we define this execution policy object, IP. And initially, we set it to seek. It means that the algorithm will uh, work as tra in traditional way. And then we set some threshold, let it be 100,000. And we check whether the size of our input will exceed this threshold. And if that's the case, then we will change our execution policy to a parallel. And otherwise, we will left it intact. So it will mean the sequential execution will happen. And at the end, in line number seven, we are using this sort uh, function, which, is, which comes from SCD parallel. And the very first argument is this execution policy. And the rest of the interface is actually the same as it was at uh, as it was with normal STL algorithms. Okay, so this is how actually it's going to look lo like in C plus plus seventeen. Okay, but still we need to remember that we are in C plus plus, and so now the question is, what if we introduce a data race? Because we, from time to time we need to provide some lambda function. And we'll do some nasty thing and introduce some uh, deadlock or, or data race or whatever. Then the STL, which is parallelized, will not take responsibility for us. So if we don't, if we can't write proper code, then the STL uh, parallelized version of STL will not help us. And the second thing is exceptions. An exception in user code can also happen, and. And when it happens while we are using parallelized execution, then all of the exceptions that were thrown in all threads will be joined into one list of exceptions. And these exceptions uh, will be thrown to us. But in case we are using a parallelized with vectorization execution policy, then in case of an exception, there's no way to actually recover from the situation. So the std terminate function will be called and we will be perhaps out of luck. So as usual, we need to be cautious with C++. It's not that easy. We need to make sure that the whole program is correct with tests, tests, and tests. OK, and now ha let's have some other minor changes that are still meaningful, at least I believe so. So the first one is, maybe you know this one, the observer pointer. Anyone heard about it? So it's referred as uh, the world dumbest smart pointer ever. Why? <laughs> well, it means that this pointer will do nothing in this sector. It will just hold the pointer as a field of the class, but it will do nothing. So what is the reason to have such, such a pointer? Any ideas? Exactly, that's, that's the right answer. We'd like to be more explicit here. Because if we imagine a function 
that comes from uh, legacy code or maybe even not legacy code and it returns a unique pointer, then we'll see what is the, who, who is going to take over the uh, ownership. If the re function returns short pointer, then we also will uh, know what's going to happen. But if the return type is just a pointer, then we don't actually know whether we should delete this resource after using the function and uh, after using the resource itself, or the system, the library that we're using will do it for, for us. So what we need, we need to go to the code and see the implementation or read some documentation, and that's not very good. That's why we will have this observer pointer. It will indicate that the, we are just observing some resource. Just small indication and it will help us read our programs. Okay, and the second thing is that if you have some generic function and you'd like to use a constant version of a parameter, what do you do? Any ideas? Constcast. Constcast, but the problem with constcast is that if you made it wrong, then you can drop some qualifiers like volatile or, or something. And if you want to make it right, then you need to actually use this decal type wrap it all and it will look like a crap so that's why that's why uh, some guys decided to introduce some helper to a library as const so if you have some type you don't actually care whether it is volatile or is a pointer or reference or just an object you just use as constant it will work just like this the third thing is string view maybe you heard about it as well so if you have a huge string, which is, let's say, 100 megabytes, which it can be the case in some servers or browsers, then if you want to get the substring of the string and pass it to some other place, what do you do? We have two options, basically. We can get const car uh, star and a length that we like to paste or we can use a substring function from a string. But both of them uh, have their own drawbacks. Like with pointers, the pointer can become dangling. And with a CD string, the substring will return by value. So it will copy everything. And we don't actually want to copy 10 megabytes of a string from one place to another. That's why the community developed the string view uh, you can also actually find another names like uh, string reference, string piece, and so on, but this is, you know, bike shedding. And the purpose of this class is to actually introduce a uh, concept of a range in a string that you can pass to other places, and this will be very lightweight. Okay, and actually, there are a lot of changes that are going to be in C17, and I only included those which are, let's say, which will influence this programming language, at least in my opinion, mostly. But if you'd like to see all of the changes, then I suggest you to go to the Reddit and find uh, a post from STL, and by STL I don't mean the library, but the guy, as uh, its, its nickname is STL. Okay, so what we can see now is that C++ is catching up. This is some famous picture of how enterprises are catching up after changes in the rest of the world. So here we have adoption and here we have time and some new technology emerged and the rest of the world is just like this. And at some point, whole open source and whole world will use this new technology but in the meantime, the enterprise will say, ignore, 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 no, no. I said, no, damn it. Oh, no. And then when everybody uses a new technology, the enterprise will say, oh, crap. And they will have uh, to catch up very quickly. And I think we can put C++ here. Because for a long time, uh, we saw nothing happening. And then we can see that a lot of 
new t functionality is going to be included in C++, which is a very good thing, actually. Okay, and if you take separately all of the things that I actually told, then you can think, okay, it's not big fuss, it's not any revolution at all. However, if you combine all of those things, so you'll have a program that will use modules, concepts, network, file system, and transmissible functions, then the program will look and feel completely different comparing to what we have now. And this is my point, that if you combine everything, then the program will, be, will look completely different. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Swavik, and uh, I'd like to open the floor for the last Q&A uh, this afternoon. So questions for Swavik, please. <laughs> Raise your hands if you'd please be so don't kind. Ask difficult ones. Gentlemen <laughs> over there, and then over there, please. Is the modules uh, finally uh, voted, or are, are they uh, developed right now? So I uh, emailed uh, Gabriel Dos Reis and asked him about it, and uh, he told me that uh, they are not voted out, but they are discussing about the ship vehicle. So this will be either technical specification or it will be uh, uh, part of the standard itself. And in June next year, we will have a standard meeting in Oulu, Finland. And on this meeting, it's a plan to feature complete C++, so we will have the final answers. But they came so far that I believe that modules will come to C++. Hello. Hello. Uh, on CppCon 2015, Vyarna Source presented uh, core guidelines. It's a set of rules, but it's also enforced with uh, some static analysis tool. Uh, they developed with Herb Sutter, and uh, one of the uh, key points there is to introduce uh, owner of uh, T-Star and T-Star. So mm, Bjarne's idea was to uh, mark all, all the mm, observing pointers as row pointers and mark all the pointers that can actually manage the lifetime of the objects as uh, owner. So this is something simpler than smart pointers, and yet it makes uh, the observer pointer uh, that you presented today like somehow obsolete, especially that uh, core guidelines is already shipped and you can use it today. Okay, thank you for sharing this information. Uh, the core guidelines, I know about this project, but I, I had no time to familiarize myself with it. Uh, if that's true, then of course we'll uh, have no need for this observer pointer. Hi. <coughs> okay. Uh, here. Uh, oh, right here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would myself uh, define a rather uh, C++ hater, but I'm really glad uh, you guys are catching up to the <laughs> high-level languages uh, like Haskell, because uh, <laughs> uh, well, as a, C++ is not high-level language at all. <laughs> yes, it is. C in comparison to <laughs> uh, C++, it is for sure. But uh, uh, I have a question. Are you afraid uh, that, aren't you afraid that uh, these uh, new features are built on a shaky uh, background, like uh, these things, uh, wh what was before, and uh, it will collapse someday? Because uh, from my point of view, the language wasn't designed to support uh, all those things, and uh, it uh, looks uh, really shaky for okay, me. Okay, I, I get the point. Uh, so the concern here is that everything will collapse. <laughs> um, but please keep in mind that uh, libraries like Rangers, like file system, like network, they all come from other places like Boost. And we already are experienced with those for years. So for sure, it will not collapse, at least not in span of several year, next years. Okay, uh, oh, one more thing. Uh, but uh, I saw uh, there is 
a lot of uh, new stuff, uh, right? Uh, for example, those ranges uh, that are that were very similar to, uh, for example, what I saw, uh, filter and map uh, in other languages, which uh, you could really uh, write in half of the one line you wrote uh, in C++. So, uh, don't you feel that it's a really overextension that uh, C++ should uh, be, uh, there should be another language built uh, on, with, um, for example, uh, experience from C++ uh, and uh, covering those new grounds? So, I can say that we definitely need ranges uh, and those ranges enable us to have some more stuff and why not having more stuff in, in a language. It will enable us to write in more functional style, so it will enable some paradigms, that's, that's, very, that's a very big feature of ranges. So the point here is that we are not creating another language, we are just extending the existing one. And if, of course, we need to use the right tool for the job, so maybe you have to actually think about it and make a decision whether you actually would like to go with C++ or Haskell or some other language. Okay. Are there any plans of making STL containers thread safe? Uh, the containers? Yeah. You mean uh, vector? Yeah, to be used for multiple threads without data races. Well, you need to have locks. Yeah, but are there any plans of embedding this directly in the language? Uh, not really. Okay. In C++, the, the motto is that you don't actually pay for a thing that you don't use because it could affect non-threaded code as well. So that's why we are not having this by default. Do you know if modules are designed to uh, be um, implemented in a, in a compiled or semi-compiled form? Or, or will they be just source that's included uh, in, in, in... So you mean whether the compiler will implement the whole thing? Whether, whether modules will be generated into a binary file that will contain maybe some... Uh, well, I don't think so. I think that modules will leave no footprint in binary. Do you happen to find out how they are going to implement uh, asynchronous support? Uh, Await keyword like okay. in C sharp or using mm -hmm. fiber approach. And the second question: uh, What about parallelism? Uh, are they going to um, implement uh, thread pool I in a standard library uh, level? Okay, so the first question was about how they are going to implement, and it's an excellent question. However, uh, I can't answer it right now. So the f the short answer is that. They will implement uh, stackless coroutines. So if you want to see the actual implementation, I recommend to look to Boost Context because it introduces, because C++ is stack-based and coroutines are not. So that's why you actually need to write on some assembly in order to get it working. Or you use some hacks like DAV device and I go to, but we don't like go to, so we have to solve this uh, in other way. And uh, this is the perfect place for a compiler because the compiler is generating a code. So we should have this task of generating the code for coroutines in, in a compiler and not in some library, like it is with Boost Context. And the second question was about the event loop, whether this is going to be part of a uh, standard library. Well, I don't, I'm not sure, but perhaps it will be part of. Because in other libraries like uh, networking, you will have this uh, event loop implemented and it will be a part of 
the library. So I think I suppose that the same thing will will have with uh, coroutines, and we will be even able to utilize the one from the no networking library. That's my idea. Do you know if are the plans to move uh, boost compute library that uh, introduces new style of uh, computation that you can uh, compute something on a uh, graphic card for example are there plans to move it to C++ 17 well uh, I, I don't know whether they have some plans I uh, I read some reports from from the trips uh, from some guys, but I spot no uh, mention about it. So I wouldn't expect it will be part of C++17. Maybe next release. Thank you. Thanks. Um, are those C++ modules are going? Are they going Can you to? Can speak louder, please? Am I louder now? Yes. Yeah. Thank well. you. Uh, are C++ modules going to uh, decrease the compilation and linking time, or maybe not neither? Uh, so the question is whether modules are modules, going to yeah, increase. Comp yeah, like uh, because there was a question whether okay, modules are going to produce some binary yeah. artifacts. Okay. Okay. So it's a very good question because I had in mind to actually talk about this, but I uh, forgot. Uh, so the modules are going to solve uh, multiple problems, and one of the problem is the compilation speed. Because with this preprocessor and inclusion model we have, the compiler need to actually open the file over and over again and process it. With modules, it will open it once, and since in the export block you can't actually use the preprocessor, then it will do so only once, and this is an area for a speed, speed up, right? And the other problems solved by modules are like the library writer can actually control what is being exported. This is a big feature. And the user can be very picky about it. And even if you take things like uh, IDEs, currently you need to pass all of the flags, everything to the, to the IDE or some other tool. So it will provide you with good suggestions, now it will be easier to ask, so even tools will benefit from it. Okay, and follow, follow up. Uh, is it going to in any way change the linking time? Because this is like the, the biggest uh, bottleneck that I found. Uh, well, it depends on the implementation in compilers. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, in case you were wondering, the upcoming revolution in C++ was prepared, produced and presented by Nokia's own Sławek Zborowski. <laughs>